Hello, we are back. I hope you have enjoyed your networking time. But now let me welcome to the stage Ast Astor Numelin Kalsberg. He's from Estocol, but he works in Open Forum Europe policy as a policy director in Brussels, Belgium. And he will be talking with us about the political challenges and opportunities for open source in Europe. Welcome, Aston. You can come to the stage. Yes, wait, did I do that? Wait, am I on? No, camera all. Does it work? Yes. Hello, Aston. Okay, hi. I'm going to get my uh, presentation up as well. Hope that works. Does it look okay? Yes, it's perfect. Okay. Very good. Yes, for the attendees, remember that you can write questions to Aston in the Q&A. And he will answer you when he finishes the presentation. Yeah, absolutely. Well, so okay, cool. Soon. Hello, everyone. Uh, well, thanks very much to the Open Expo team and everyone involved setting this up. Uh, so, you know, it's Friday. I'll get uh, uh, right to it. So, um, uh, essentially, I would like to start off this talk with a key question that I've been thinking about for uh, the last two years, essentially. And that is, uh, why did free and open source software development end up as an unintended casualty in the original proposal of the copyright directive uh, that, yeah, it's an EU directive. And this is in a time when EU politicians rave about the digital uh, transformation, uh, that be it blockchain, IoT, supercomputers, you know, these are technologies, all of which are heavily developed, uh, dependent on open source solutions. And yet, when they proposed a new copyright directive, no one thought of software, which is, mind you, regulated by copyright. Um, so simply put, had open source policy advocates not spotted the risks from this uh, directive, the platforms that developers rely on uh, to collaborate, you know, be it GitLab, GitHub, um, uh, risk being regulated out of practical use. And so um, thinking about this question, uh, it's brought me to kind of the general idea, I guess maybe an argument that I'd like to uh, make here today. Uh, and that is that uh, while the realities of um, innovation in software has evolved over the years, uh, and I guess in this context, I mainly think of uh, uh, open source software becoming more mainstream than ever, uh, policymakers in the political space, and I work in Brussels, so I'm thinking mostly about the EU, but I think this is true for across of Europe, policymakers have not kept up in terms of knowledge. And so this was true for the copyright directive, and it's true essentially for the entire policy realm. So, okay, there is a knowledge discrepancy in tech policy. I don't think this is news to anyone who, uh, you know, has a foot in both worlds. But what I also would like to argue, which is perhaps a bit more controversial, and is that open source advocacy and openness advocacy has not followed the times either. And I'll get into that uh, more in detail at the end of, of my presentation, but I would like to stress how important it is right now, and in the, in the let's say, one, two years to come, that open source, uh, the broad community, and openness advocacy, uh, generally speaking as well, uh, it's extremely important that we step up our game, our political game in the coming years. Because with open source going mainstream, there are new risks and new uh, opportunities. The political conversation around open source, uh, it has to go beyond what it has focused on in the past, uh, and open source now has to be acknowledged as a, uh, being of strategic importance uh, uh, for Europe's digital future. And to be part of a conversation on that level, on a strategic level for Europe, the open source ecosystem needs to build the capacity to become a trusted partner of governments and public authorities. And this is all in order to, to stave off risks to some extent, but also capture the big opportunities that exist politically right now. 
So, uh, yeah, before I get into talking about what happened with the copyright directive and current political trends, uh, let, in, uh, let me introduce uh, uh, Open Forum Europe, uh, the think tank uh, that I work for in Brussels. Uh, we have for maybe, uh, I think it's 17 years now, uh, we have devoted our times to uh, our time to explain the merits and uh, merits of openness in computing to politicians and legislators across Europe. So our vision is to uh, facilitate uh, open and competitive choice for IT users. And this includes open source software, of course, uh, but we also work a lot with open standards, procurement policy, um, anything touching cloud, uh, internet policy as well. So we have many different fo uh, focus areas, but uh, a lot of our history is based in uh, open source policy. So yeah, what actually happened in the copyright debate? Um, just as a quick update, I don't know if you are aware or have followed the process, but uh, the copyright directive has now become EU law and is currently being transposed into national law. This will take maybe a year, year and a half more. So, but going back to the last few months of negotiations in Brussels, so this was um, about a year ago, uh, the directive started to receive a lot of public attention. You might have seen some stuff online. Um, but as maybe some of you in the audience know, uh, this directive had gone through the policy process for many years before it gained uh, public attention. Uh, I think it was proposed in 2016. Um, and when it was proposed, you know, critics, including ourselves, were first to, uh, were fast to point out that um, two main things. Uh, it failed to present reforms that would create a, a real single market for, for copyright. Um, but what it really did was that it introduced some really far reaching changes into copyright liability and new rights for, for uh, publishers, uh, among other things. So very strong pro kind of a copyright maximalist uh, angle. And to really try to simplify this law, it is a lot of things, but it essentially tries to do one thing, and that is to um, strengthen the negotiation position of European rice holders industries uh, in order to move money from uh, essentially large American internet giants, so mainly Google and Facebook, and move that money through a strengthened negotiation position to European rights holders. And this was uh, to be done uh, through the now, at least in my circles, relatively infamous uh, Article 11, uh, 11 uh, the so-called link tax. And uh, then there was uh, Article 13, which uh, is also referred to sometimes as the censorship machines, but it was a liability shift for platforms that they were gonna be responsible and hold liability for uh, the copyrighted material uh, users uh, of those platforms uploaded. So, what was this then? Um, what I think and how I see it is that it was kind of a technocratic, or it was very much a technocratic solution uh, from the European Commission to a very specific problem, which had been formulated by the rights holders and the big rights holders industry. Um, the problem was kind of the limitations of this problem description. Because I've had a few meetings with the commission lawyers who actually wrote the, the copyright proposal and they are very skilled IP lawyers. It's not, uh, uh, let's say a level, or the problem was not with their um, uh, professionalism. Uh, in their defense, they were presented with this very specific problem and they provided a solution to that problem. But for us and many others, let's say actors that use platforms that are not the main big ones, uh, the problem had to do with unintended consequences. And one of the most controversial points uh, was this Article 13. It's actually called Article 17 now. That was a little bit of uh, political maneuvering on the, uh, uh, in the Parliament and Commission side. But uh, this introduced a liability shift uh, to the platform market. So to make a long story short, this liability shift would lead to an obligation uh, to platforms to mass filter content uploaded by users. And there's a lot to be say about this, but uh, I, you know, for, for, for the sake of this talk, I will focus on the consequences for code sharing platforms and code repositories. And here, the scary truth is that nobody throughout the first, I say year and a half, two years, ever thought about uh, open source software development platforms. It wasn't not disregarded, it was simply forgotten. Um, 
because the original proposal would have required software development platforms uh, like GitLab, Bitbucket, GitHub to scan and automatically remove code that got stuck in the filters. So this could inadvertently break software uh, in part due to the lack of, of effective uh, filtering technologies. So there's a high rate of false positives. And in the case of, of uh, software development, as you know, uh, it's uh, it's not a simple upload download. It's a relatively complex ecosystem of tools that interacts uh, within these uh, repositories. So, in response to this, uh, my organization, Open Forum Europe, together with the Free Software Foundation Europe, I think they spoke uh, uh, on this conference earlier, um, launched uh, the SaveCodeShare.eu campaign, and. Uh, we worked actively together with uh, European free and open source uh, software activists uh, and advocacy organizations. Um, that, you know, organized several meetings and calls, both in Brussels and in the member states' capitals. And after about a year, we managed to get the case uh, to protect open source software development on the political agenda. And uh, Interestingly, there was broad support across the political spectrum and in the different European institutions that open source, yeah, there's uh, this is very important. We shouldn't, to protect, let's say, uh, music labels, we don't have to go and mess around with uh, open source software development. And uh, so there was general agreement. It's important that these platforms don't fall within the scope of the copyright directive. And this kind of lack of, of uh, uh, friction or uh, anyone really fighting against this is also very noteworthy, especially in a town in Brussels where everything is kind of fought over politically. Mm -hmm. And this also indicates that nobody ever intended to regulate uh, software development platforms. But in the council, which is where the EU governments negotiate the law, so you have the parliament on one side and then the council negotiates on the other side, uh, most government representatives that we spoke to, they wanted to respect their pledge to open source. And uh, if, despite this, their first negotiation mandate, um, uh, which is their first kind of version of the text that they, they take to the negotiation with the parliament, they under, managed to undermine this commitment. And this was, you know, you've probably heard this before, but it was largely due to a misunderstanding of the mainstream commercial nature of open source today. Uh, they only excluded non-for-profit software development platforms. Um, you know, so good by uh, GitLab, good by GitHub, profit-making uh, platforms. Um, simply, you know, you've heard this. You know, they saw it essentially open source as an activity that you know was some kind of hobby activity. Um, and then, I guess, from running this entire campaign over there, I think year and a half, two years that we ran it. Um, uh, I, there are two main uh, observations that I made, uh, and they kind of lead to the same conclusion. And that the first observation is simply that open source software development platforms and code, code repositories, they were an unintended consequence. And I really want to underline this point. It was unintended. Um, and this is in a time when the commission is also pushing for European innovation uh, in AI, I, uh, IoT, smart cities, smart mobility, whatever. And, you know, all of these are heavily dependent on open source. And the second observation then is that when policymakers were made aware of this is not something that they don't wanna, wanna um, harm, they still didn't manage to get the text right because they don't understand the open source ecosystem and the way software is developed today. And so the conclusion from these two things is simply that kind of the analytical tools that um, are used to solve, uh, uh, or that, that policymakers use to solve uh, uh, different policy issues in the digital realm, they're still very analog. Uh, and I, I really feel that our, our experience with the, the copyright directive gave us a very clear example of policymakers under immense uh, uh, political pressure to regulate the tech industry, um, entered into this conversation with a lack of knowledge and awareness of open source and a lack of, of understanding of how it actually works and the role it plays. So this perhaps can be seen as a bit of a moot point. Like it's not a surprise to anyone that there is a discrepancy between the nature of cutting edge digital innovation and 
policy making. But uh, I hope that this this uh, uh, this little story, I guess, of, of our work with the copyright directive can kind of serve as a backdrop as we look into the current political challenges and opportunities for open source in Europe. Um, and here I've divided up the challenges and opportunities, but uh, I mean, in many ways, what we're seeing right now uh, uh, in the pipeline and what we're working with currently everything is a result of, of the kind of mainstreaming of open source in the software markets. Um, and as and the big point that I would like to, to uh, argue for here is that as open source has gone big, uh, there are some fundamental political dynamics that change. Um, when you get big, politics around you change. So uh, let's see. Yeah, let's get to the, the challenges. Um, well, first of all, um, the EU governments, as I said, and the European Commission, as you've probably seen in the news, uh, they are really stepping up to regulate uh, uh, the tech space. Um, and digital policy is one of the most uh, heavily fo focused on areas with the new commission. Uh, and this development has been been referred to, perhaps this is very Brussels insider stuff, but it's been referred to as the age of regulation for, for uh, tech and especially the platform economy. And right now, very big pieces of legislation are being prepared in order to, on the one hand, hold platforms uh, responsible, uh, regulate AI in different ways around liability and, and trust and security, but also, of course, on how data is handled um, and fintech, uh, there's also a new industrial strategy, uh, really based on digital transformation, um, which touches on everything from data to IoT. Um, and I mean, an interesting thing now, just looking back on the last few weeks, is that um, the current public health crisis and the, the COVID-19 situation has really sped up these political developments rather than slow them down, because there's a deep realization that um, there are some issues with with uh, the European infrastructure and our digital uh, uh, offerings and, and status. So, um, looking at this age of regulation and all these pe uh, pieces of uh, uh, legislation coming out, um, I know for a fact that if we don't step up our game, we are going to see a lot of unintended consequences again, which might harm open source software uh, development and um, as well as open source vendors. Uh, and uh, or what we know right now uh, is that, you know, one source of concern is the upcoming Digital Services Act, which is the big piece of platforms regulation. Um, and we're also expecting a legislative follow-up on the commission's AI white paper uh, in less than a year. Their risks lie in a lot of liability uh, uh, regulation, uh, which if done sloppily could, uh, you know, put a lot of liability on an individual AI, like open source contributor to an AI project. And, uh, but really, I, I'm not gonna spend too much time on, you know, going into different details uh, on these upcoming legal proposals, because that would be a lot of speculation. There's, uh, it's still in the process. Um, and that is, there's also more, a more general point to be made here. And that is that with all these regulatory seal at the moment, together with the lack of understanding of open source and open technologies in It seems as his camera is not working now. So we will come back as soon as possible. We are back. Aston, please. You can come to the stage. <laughs> 
Hi. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry about that, everyone. I hope uh, I hope that went okay. I'm, I'm going to share the screen again. Okay, uh, down. I let you continue. Let's hope this works now. Um, yes, I hope you can hear me okay. Um, well, I'm going to go back a little bit because I'm not sure exactly where my computer froze. But essentially, the point that I was trying to make was there's a lot of laws coming <laughs> coming our way, regulating the tech space. Uh, but at the same time, there is this lack of knowledge uh, around open technologies and open source and how software is developed uh, collaboratively today. And so, um, yeah, the simple point that I'm trying to make here is that it is just a lot more regulation coming, um, which means that there's a lot more political risk. Um, and think about it also in terms of digitization as a whole. Um, it can be the digitization of healthcare, uh, agriculture, smart cities, you know, you name it. It will be very difficult to predict from where and in what law uh, this regulatory risk could come from. Um, it could be, on a, we had an example in the UK where uh, very damaging uh, legislation came out and, you know, a very well-meaning directive against anti, you know, against money laundering. Um, and it came through liability checks on uh, uh, Bitcoin wallets. So, and here I think uh, it's also... Uh, uh, kind of a, another general point to be made. Uh, it's a bit different, but it's very, it hits close to home for, for our organization, OFE. And that is, we also might see a lot of regulation that just chokes openness in general and cements the role of big tech incumbents. Uh, because they are also often the only ones that can comply with the, the big liability regulations. But anyhow, Back to this uh, digitization of society part. It, in many ways, it is of course also an opportunity for, for open source um, as uh, uh, there are a lot of new uh, business opportunities and new markets uh, and areas where, where uh, open source software vendors can sell things. But um, one of the biggest challenges I think that we have uh, ahead of us, uh, you know, in uh, being uh, open as advocates is that if we find, you know, think about it, if we find the lock-in uh, experience that we had with, with the desktop environments problematic, uh, something that we've engaged with and many other uh, free and open source software advocates have been fighting for, for over the years, then consider the challenge of the lock-in when we digitize all aspects of society. The potential societal consequences, consequences of inaction around openness today I mean, it, it is of way greater magnitudes than those uh, earlier fights that free and open source software advocates have engaged in over the years. And, uh, you know, as I stated earlier, uh, the age of regulation digitization of society will be shaped by policymakers that have a limited awareness, knowledge, and understanding of digital issues in general, uh, especially collaborative and open soft, uh, source software development. Okay, let's go to the opportunities then, uh, because it's not all doom and gloom. And I will uh, kick off by uh, a little description of what's going on in Germany, so the largest EU country, uh, and uh, how this interlinks with the developments in Brussels. So, uh, in the last year or so, it's been quite interesting to follow the developments in Germany. Uh, and uh, just in the last few months, I would say six months or so, the German government, uh, but also many of the, the uh, other political parties, have released a set of publications and statements around digital sovereignty. And uh, something that uh, is in particular interesting is the GAIA-X project. And so, one could to simplify it down quite a lot, and it's uh, that it's arguably, it all stems uh, these efforts uh, from the fraud trade relationship with the Trump administration, but also concerns with Europe being overly dependent on non-European platforms and digital infrastructure. And uh, 
this this iteration of the digital sovereignty concept, and of course, the similar discussions exist also both in China and, and in the U.S. To take uh, the typical examples of comparison that we use in Brussels, but um, in the European context, this was a, a, a concept really put forward strongly by Emmanuel Macron back in 2017 at the Sorbonne in in Paris. And uh, one way of reading the latest developments is that Macron was quite good at putting this high up on the uh, political agenda, and now the Germans are kind of stepping in to, in to uh, define in their interest um, uh, what digital sovereignty should and can be. So at the end of the last year, there was a flurry of declaration and reports, uh, and many of them are very relevant to open source, um, and they came from the German government. So first, it was the Microsoft report, which came from the CIO, CTO kind of role uh, for the German federal government. And they concluded that the, the, the federal government administration's uh, uh, dependence on Microsoft Office uh, for the administration undermined Germany's digital sovereignty. Um, this came from the top CTO, CIO in, in, in Germany, um, on the federal government, that is. And then at the same time, um, I think it was just a week after, there was something called the Dortmund Declaration, which presented the Gaia-X project. And they proposed a federated data infrastructure, or cloud infrastructure, with open source and open standards at its core. And depending on who you ask, it's everything from a library of European cloud uh, providers or a way for European you know, cloud users to, to lower their licensing fees to AWS. Um, you get a little, it's still a little bit unclear. Um, but what we have heard from uh, open source companies that have been working with the German government, uh, GAIX, is that there is a good deal of funding behind this project. And as it stands right now, the project has developed into this Franco-German-led project um, and it's backed by the EU. 40 plus uh, companies have uh, joined together and they're forming a non-for-profit non, uh, non in Belgium to host the project, uh, potentially even hosting code. We're not really sure yet. Um, so all of this combines, including some political statements from the parties, uh, into this very strong political vision that really centers open and openness at the center uh, uh, of the Germans' view of um, digital sovereignty. And, uh, you know, in many ways, the Germans want to avoid lock into American or Chinese vendors when they digitize all aspects of society and to break these historical dependencies. And just a final point now, because it starts in, I think, a week and a half or so, but, you know, the Germans are, are planning to put a lot of these issues high up on the agenda when their presidency of the European Council starts, um, which is a very, you know, a, a strong way of kind of lead. You have agenda setting power and they, they're, they're six months uh, uh, in the in the chair starts in a week and a half. But uh, so what is the Ger uh, European Commission doing? Well, it's now in place and digital sovereignty is touching almost everything digital. Um, it's everything from a digital tax, platform regulation, thoughts around procurement, and it's big on the, the new uh, uh, industrial strategy, which is very much shaped by, by the digital transformation, as they call it. There are positive signs, but I have to say that it was very noteworthy that there were essentially no mentions of open source in the big EU digital strategies published in February. Um, uh, while, you know, traditional ICT standardization was mentioned over and over again. But now, this was noteworthy because last November, the Commission hosted its biggest open source conference to date. Uh, it was called Open Source Beyond 2020, and just quite <laughs> as a fun fact, the Commission interest, uh, expected it, there to be some interest in this event, absolutely, but they ended up having twice or three times as many people registering that could actually attend, even though they added all these overflow rooms and things. And uh, this interest from the open source community was very much noted uh, uh, by the Commission. And this workshop focused very clearly on what the European could do for, uh, to, to foster uh, more open source innovation in Europe, absolutely. But in return, they really underlined the interest in what open source can do for Europe, the EU, and the European citizen. Because this is, in the end of the day, the mandate of the European Commission. And in addition to this, uh, the Commission is right now working, well, we are actually at Open Forum Europe, but for the Commission, working on a study, an economic impact study uh, of uh, open source software and open source hardware. 
uh, and economic impact uh, uh, on the European markets. Um, and it also includes uh, questions around the uh, open source role in competitiveness and technological independence. So uh, this has been uh, stated by the Commission as one of the main studies uh, that will steer uh, open source policy making for the next five, ten years. Um, and the plan from the D, uh, from DG Connect, which is the Department of Digital Policy in the Commission, is to host an even bigger conference on open source uh, when the study is out in early 2021. And for this, at least, they have booked the biggest conference venue that the Commission has. So, that, but then the question is: Okay, they're having some conferences. What is it that they want to do with uh, with these efforts? Uh, and I believe that we were told at uh, one of our events uh, that we hosted, uh, one of our pre-FOSTEM events uh, in, in January by Pierce O'Donoghue, one of the directors at DG Connect. He spoke uh, essentially what he did. He, was, he, he presented that the commission challenges open source as a community of stakeholders to show them what open source can do for, for society and for Europe. And what this means is that they would like us to step up and explain how open source can play a strategic role in solving the big challenges facing Europe. And in some ways, to kind of circle back to my story uh, earlier, it's about going away from these defensive campaigns now, um, like the one against the copyright directive and then the big one against software patents before it, to become and build a relationship to become a trusted partner of government to deliver solutions and answers to questions uh, of a strategic nature and to deliver on a strategic scale. Here, open source, and this is what the commission is starting to realize, at least pockets of it. Um, open source provides a solution to how to maintain control and independence um, and securing internal know-how of the technologies uh, by having access to the source code. Um, you allow the Commission and Europe to take part in the, the, the collaborative development while you also keep Europe open for business. You enable European SMEs to take part in the markets uh, while still not closing the borders. It's a non-chauvinist approach to uh, regaining control. Um, and I think this is important because in our point of view at Open Forum Europe, and this, sure, there are many different political opinions here, but how we see it is that digital sovereignty shouldn't mean closing Europe to alternatives from third countries. The solution, the kind of third way, if you will, is to take it towards open technologies where we can ensure high levels of competitiveness and maintain independence and control. And to reach the Commission at the highest political level, and not those pockets that are interested in only, uh, we as open source stakeholders need to step away from these defensive campaigns. We need to look to build this trusted relationship and kind of mature our efforts to, on a completely new level than, than free and open source software uh, uh, advocates and uh, uh, activists have done um, in the past. So the question then is, of course, uh, can we do this? And if so, how? Um, and this, of course, and this is the point of why I told this story about the copyright directive. Um, this brings me back to it because I believe that there is yet another lesson to be learned from this experience. And that is the advocates and activists in the open source policy space. Um, they all have to uh, step up and get more engaged in policy work. Uh, this is part, uh, and this is not just because uh, I say it and I'm interested in policy and that's what I work with, but it's because what the reality is when open source software has gone mainstream and it's gotten big, it's also increased its political power and potential. And this is just a reality. Like the power and potential of open source and the important strategic role of open source has grown as it's gone mainstream. But at the same time, a lot of open source advocacy looks at looks the same as it did 10, 15 years ago. You know, there are calls for action online, there are open letters, there are meetups. And he like really don't get me wrong, this has been and is still extremely important. The community of activists and organizations that fight for, for free and open source software, uh, digital rights, is only going to grow in importance in the coming years when we see this rollout of, of a lot of regulation. 
but I want to see open source activism being coupled with, you know, mature, effective open source advocacy. Because activism as such is mostly reactive. And, you know, around the copyright directive, we saw this massive uh, roar from internet users in response to it. But activism of this sort, while being insanely important, this is not how you become a trusted partner in strategic decisions. So, yes, going back to the copyright directive, with the current capacity and how we do things, we managed to get an exclusion for open source software development and sharing platforms from the copyright directive. But to be honest, this was just putting lipstick on a pig. Uh, the state of open source policy can almost be summarized with the fact that open source software development was an unintended victim. Open source was forgotten despite its mainstream nature today, despite how the digital transformation runs on open source. It was forgotten. And keep in mind that the, the copyright campaign that we ran, it focused on just a small exclusion uh, in the text. Uh, There's a very minor legal change. And but because our efforts were reactive and not proactive, it ended up being a hugely costly and time-consuming uh, process. All of this should have been solved at the, the, the source. And this ability of solving it at the source is what we need to be able to do. We should have had meetings in 2014 when they started thinking about revising EU copyright laws. Um, but all of this, you know, none of this will come easily. Uh, it's up to the community and the stakeholders in the community to make sure that history doesn't repeat itself. Uh, we need to make sure that we're not forgotten. And this, I think, is what, what, what modern uh, and mature and effective advocates can help do. You know, looking to the long term, in the age of regulation and digital sovereignty and all the aspects that I've talked about, we all need to work together to bridge this knowledge gap that I've talked about, and that is kind of just the defensive part. Because then we also need to find and seek and find new ways of communicating to, with policymakers, governments, parliamentarians, and really make the point that open source software is no longer on the fringe, that it's mainstream. But it's not just about that you say it, you also need, it's also about how you say it. Um, you know, thinking about it, like uh, the biggest uh, European industrial companies today run open source. Um, and that means that larger stakeholders, both vendors and users of open source, they need to take a responsibility too. And this, you know, again, I'm going back to the copyright directive just to maintain the story, but the game changer in the Save Code Share campaign that we ran was when our open letter reached uh, the team of uh, the open source team at one of Germany's largest uh, industrial companies. So instead of just signing the letter online, uh, you know, uh, being like, yeah, we support this letter, um, they simply picked up the phone and called their, their policy team in Brussels. Um, two weeks later, literally two weeks later, we saw a new language that worked in the European Parliament's version of the law. Because in the end of the day, it was a, the member of Parliament that was in charge of the copyright directive. He was a German pro-industry conservative. In that moment, you need a big European industrial company to put forward your argument. That it, or you don't need to, but that is the most effective way. So the kind of the tool that I would like to offer to anyone that cares about open source software uh, today um, is to, you know, if you work in a big company, reach out to the company's policy teams and build a relationship with them. You know, are you a developer at, a, a, at one of these large companies? Say, I don't want to call anyone out, but let's say Telefonica. Explain and educate your policy and government relations team. The, the lobbyists for your companies probably don't understand the importance of software developers and open source to keep their companies innovative. Um, but the fact is, when public policy teams become in, uh, uh, educated, you know, often, and the best way is that it happens by their own internal developers, interesting things can really happen. And if you, you run an, uh, a European open source software or, or you're a vendor uh, you know, running an SME selling uh, open source solutions, uh, question is, are you supporting and are you engaging with your national open source business alliance? Are you taking part of the policy discussions? Um, 
and by extension is your national uh, open source business alliance involved in European policy making because that's where a majority of the laws that will regulate your market and your future will come from. I mean, this is another example of, of what I mean when it comes to maturing uh, open source advocacy efforts. Uh, when I started uh, Open Forum Europe um, around two and a half years ago, I asked uh, my CEO, um, who in Brussels represents open source businesses? Um, and the answer was that there isn't an organization representing open source businesses in Europe. And this is a city where like, the European elevator floor manufacturers have their own association. Now, this is changing. Uh, things are happening on this front, and we can talk about that later if you're interested. But the point that I really want to, to convey is that now we have to take on the collective responsibility and kind of solve the collective action problems that exist around effective uh, uh, policy advocacy to, on the one hand, just make sure, you know, the lowest bar should be to make sure that free and open source software never becomes an unintended casualty again. It should not be forgotten again. But if we're a bit more uh, ambitious, or rather a lot more ambitious, we need to make sure that there's a new level of seriousness and a new level of funding between policy efforts. Uh, from all the from the national open source business associations to the European ones, to the advocacy organizations, to the uh, uh, to the free software organizations, and that is because the challenges and opportunities are different now. Simply, when open source has gone mainstream, everything is bigger. So yeah, well, thank you, and happy midsummer. I'm Swedish. I don't know if this is a thing in your countries, but it's uh, it's a uh, uh, it's a holiday for us. So uh, I'm happy to take any questions. Um, if not, we can talk about, yeah, I don't know, the European Open Source Business Alliance or, or uh, maybe the study we're writing. Thank you very much, Astor. Thank you very much for this presentation. Yes, as Astor tells you, you have any question, you can use the Q&A to create. We oh. have a question in the chat. OK. We have a question. Maybe, mm, Jan, you would like to, to come to the stage and have the question? Sure. Yes. Okay. I think you are here. No. So, okay. I appreciated. I appreciated your talk. Okay. Hi, John. Um, I have obviously been in this business a long time, and mm -hmm. what I have observed is that there's a lot of companies who say, yes, we like open source, maybe even love open source, but that may come from a certain place in their business. However, when it comes to the people who actually are in control, they are more interested in the profit motive than they are in open source. I can't blame them on certain, in certain concepts, but uh, good examples of this were the battle between OOXML and ODF, okay? Uh, other examples are Munich, where they had moved to open source and a certain large company put its uh, efforts into moving them back, okay? The company that- they're they're the Munich is moving back again. I know Munich it is. is moving back again. But that certain large company had a, it created a lot of confusion and problems and expense in inserting themselves, even though they loved open source. So the point of this is that open source advocates, a lot of times are volunteers and they're going up against well-funded companies that may say, yes, we're into open source, but not when it affects our bottom line. My, so my suggestion would be at the very top of any type of technological solution or technological issue, there'd be a checklist that says, have you considered its impact on open source? So that from the very beginning, people keep that in mind. As an example, in Brazil, they had a law that said, if you're going out to find a solution, you have to think about open source. Not that you necessarily choose it, but you have to at least think about it 
and discuss why you have not chosen that solution. Yeah, uh, a quick comment on that last thing. I think that uh, uh, taking it, kind of looking at it at a defense from a defensive point of view, which that kind of law would be, uh, uh, I think it's bang on target of what would be needed. The way we have, but I don't necessarily think that it should be a legislation. If there's one thing is that laws, and this is something that I know a lot of <laughs> open source companies that have been successful, legally speaking, or uh, uh, have noticed that sometimes they're not enforced. Uh, the way we have discussed it internally, um, partially because of some disappointments that we've had around, let's say, national laws that have gone in this kind of direction but haven't really been followed, is that there's like a culture question uh, uh, that we're looking at. And now I have very much a European, or like EU Brussels focus and like commission focus. Um, but the way we've talked about it there is something that we call the, the open source reflex. So this is more of a cultural thing, I guess. But uh, the way we've looked at being interested in modeling something would be what has happened around the concept of the startup in uh, Brussels. There's not a policymaker that writes a law without considering what is the impact for SMEs and startups. This is the kind of the first thought that a lot of the major political parties have. And I think that perhaps it's a bit too much to ask to say that as many people will think about open source uh, software development, which doesn't have the same kind of public facing relevance, but at least that the main speakers and the main representatives around digital policy have this in mind. And this is an awareness and a presence that is going to be important to be. And it's, 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 it's different when you create that kind of reflex, let's say, for the G European Greens or the Pirate Party then if you need to create a similar reflex around, let's say, the European uh, People's Party, so the cent center-right party, which is the biggest political group, those are the people, and from a defensive point of view, that we also need to reach. The problem is that when you say, if you really want sovereignty, you need to think way beyond open source software. You have to think about open source hardware, you have to think about uh, media, okay, what does that mean? And so it really touches almost everything we do. And the problem is that there's still a huge market out there driven by companies that have closed source software to maintain that closed source software. And unless you have something that absolutely pushes them to that situation, they will just ignore it. No, I, I, don't, I don't know how to answer this exactly, but it's been my observation after over 50 years in the industry. Yeah. Um, well, I mean, I think it's important here to separate, separate out. Um, I tried to make this in my presentation kind of distinction between, let's say, defensive work around open source um, which is an area where we see quite a lot of risk when it comes to different liability, uh, you know, putting in liability, uh, the red directive, uh, what you can do if you, let's say, tinker with software, if you change software, if you want to be a third party uh, offerings. Uh, a lot of that kind of work around that is also defensive, making sure that we don't mess up the ecosystem that exists in Europe. And here, Mostly we will talk about, you know, it's about like cooling effects, et cetera, on uh, open source innovation in the European markets. But when it comes to, let's say, moving our positions forward, that is where um, I would say things get a bit more complex, exactly. And you will have stakeholders that have, um, you know, depending on the issue at hand, uh, alliances will form around certain questions and certain companies that have, let's say, that are uh, more you know, I don't like using this terminology, but let's say purer open source companies um, will have certain positions. Those who, you know, in an agile way uses both 
open and closed source in order to maximize profit. They have will have their own position. But I also think one of the most important areas to look at is to kind of go outside of the, let's say, the software vendors and also look at the role of big users of open source, the, the, the Airbuses, the big industrial companies, and what role they have to also take part into this conversation, because they are very much quiet uh, on a political level. They're often have policy teams that are very much in the old manufacturing policy way that are trying to become digital. But again, the, pr the problem that I see is a lot of times by the time you, an open source advocate or somebody knowledgeable about open source hears about a situation happening, it's way down the pipe. And then it becomes defensive because you have to argue against all this other stuff, whereas you, if, if it was far about from the very beginning, yeah. then it would be a lot easier. And as an open source person, I don't have the time to just sit here in front of my computer 24 hours a day and saying, are there any new open source issues coming? Are there any new open source issues coming, right? It but why are, no, but no, it should be, no, but I'm, I'm arguing that it should be professionalized and mature. It should be, it should be, uh, policy professionals that do this work. But the problem here is that it would, we're talking about solving a collective action problem, as I see it, to have professional policy representation from the open source world. And of course, there's this classic uh, quote from, oh, I wish I, I really should remember this so it comes out snappier, but uh, one, one of the earlier Red Hat CEOs that essentially said, I, you know, I'm trying to take down, what is it, like a $500 billion market with my $5 billion company. And that, uh, in a policy space, that will reflect into different kind of muscle. But with what happened since that uh, that guy, whoever that was, I don't remember his name. Um, Bob, you know. said, yeah, that, that, yeah, I think so. But from the time that quote was made, uh, uh, he stated that till today, the amount of money that also exists around open source, plus, which is also important, I think, now I'm really like just free flowing on this, but uh, what has also happened is a lot of uh, the people that had a lot of time when they were younger, let's say 10 years ago, say the OXML, uh, the, the, the standard source, uh, which we were also heavily engaged in, many of, of the people that were very active then are now very successful businessmen. They are running businesses they don't necessarily have time to engage directly into these policy questions anymore. But maybe they shouldn't. And here's where uh, uh, efforts like organizing a European Open Source Business Association is extremely important. And sometimes it is almost, it, that is a collective action problem to solve, which is difficult to solve. If you look at the percentages, so not just numbers, but if you also look at the percentages of of uh, um, uh, open source companies. I don't have real figures on this. So this is more of a hunch. I just want to underline that. But it's not the same kind of money that goes into just having political defenses in Brussels. It's not that important if you look at the role and the kind of market that open source has today. That still exists. And that's just on the vendor side. If you look at the, uh, the depend dependencies that many companies in Europe have uh, that are users of open source solutions, let's say, you know, big industrial companies that are moving into IoT. If, if we start looking at their kind of muscle when it comes to policy and combine that and we figure out a way of leveraging that, then we're talking. Yes, but, you know, when I took a look at Microsoft, I would take a look at this box of software that they would sell that would be 400 US dollars. And inside of it was a 25 cent plastic disc. And I knew that 75% of the money that they got for that would go back into marketing to the very same people that had just bought the package. So you're, you're, you're going against a huge amount of money for, from people necessarily that are very, very, you know, very in bed with their particular business model. This may be changing because of the... I think it's changing. It may be changing, but it's still there. And the other part... Yeah, yeah, for sure. The other part of the large companies is that maybe they're 
their top people are saying, yes, open source. But that hasn't gone, that hasn't filtered down to all of their marketing people, all of their sales people in all the different areas and stuff like that, which is what I run into all the time, particularly down in, in Latin America. Yeah. No, again, I, I really don't want to go in and assume and make any assumptions, for example, around Latin America at all. Uh, again, very much just in the European context. And there are some peculiar dynamics here, uh, especially around our, our questions around sovereignty. But uh, I think a lot of things are changing and there are a lot of opportunities right now for, for maturing our efforts. Um, but, uh, you know, one positive development is that I, during this year, we'll see a new and shiny open source business uh, association, um, an umbrella organization for Europe. Um, looking forward to uh, inviting the, the Spanish uh, association as well to join. Mm -hmm. Okay, well, that's that's my question. If somebody else wants to have a chance, thank you very much for your question. Oh, thanks, John. Um, really interesting. If anyone anyone has another question, and otherwise we have to finish because it's almost eight. So. Yeah, it is almost eight, and it is Midsummer yeah. Night's Eve. That's true. It's true. So, if no one else has question, thank you very much, Pastor. For time for your presentation. Yeah. No, thank you. And yes, tomorrow we we'll have your last day. So you are welcome to come and enjoy the and futures. And we're happy to have you here again. Remember, we will send you the agenda and see you tomorrow. Thank you.